This video is brought to you by Sayrite. Visit Sayrite.com for all your project supplies, tools, and instructions. In this video tutorial, we'll show you how to make a cushion for a powerboat. This cushion takes a slanted 35 degree turn, much like a lounge chair cushion except that it is not made into three separate cushions to accommodate the shape, but rather one whole cushion that follows the slanted shape of the surface it rests on. This video features patterning, sewing, installing piping, cutting and gluing foam, and much more. At Sailrite, we're equipping you to sew at home and on the water with DIY tutorial videos and supplies and tools. Let's get started. Here you can see the old lounge cushion. It was made into three separate sections to cover the area. We're going to make this, rather than being three cushions, we're going to make this one continuous cushion uh, that will have shape. Might even work a couple colors into it to uh, have a little bit of... Uh, little color in it. Here's a before and after look. To start our project, we need to do some patterning of the area on the boat. Cindy, a professional seamstress at Sailrite, will show us how it's done. Okay, we are ready to start on this cushion area right here uh, on Brian's boat, and you can see that it's made in three separate pieces right now. Um, we're going to make this all one cushion to follow the line of this uh, fiberglass area so that we don't have these holes right here and it just it's just going to look a lot better than this one does. Um, so we're going to show you how to do that from beginning to end. I'm applying this strapping tape to the base of this cushion so that we can put the seam stick on top of that and hold the pattern in place while we make our pattern. By using strapping tape first and then applying double-sided tape on top of it, it will be easier to remove the double-sided seam stick after we're done patterning. I've got my uh, Duraskrim patterning fabric on here and I'm going to cut it um, just a little bit wider so I don't have to work with the whole width of this on here. The transfer paper off the double-sided tape is removed. Then the Duraskrim pattern material is carefully laid on top and baste it in place until it's perfectly flat on top of our shaped area. I'm going to mark the finished size of my cushion on this um, base here and I don't want the cushion to come out any farther than the edge so I'm, I've got my yardstick in just a tiny bit and I'm going to use that as my straight edge to mark this edge of the cushion. And back here, because we have this extra piece of padding here, and make sure that my Duraskrim is smoothed out towards the back. And just hold my marker perpendicular to this uh, padded piece. If this line is struck down inconsistently, it can be straightened up when we go to the table and cut it out. In this area, I wanted this to take the shape of of this curve right here. So I'm going to cut a couple of uh, slits in the Duraskrim to make it take that shape. When cutting relief slits, never cut in past where you'll be patterning on the Duraskrim pattern material. This line in the back looks a little bit wobbly right now, but I can straighten that up as I'm cutting my pattern out. Now we have a pattern that is exactly the size that we want the finished cushion to be when we're done. And I'm also going to mark these uh, where these snaps will go on the new cushion. I'm also going to mark that this is the top of the bottom plate. We're also going to mark the zipper. Uh, while we're putting our marks on here and um, we want it to be as close to the back as possible but because of these snaps I can't put it on this side of the cushion so we're going to come out from the snaps a couple of inches. We'll be installing the zipper in the bottom side of this cushion since the boxing is not straight along the back edge. And the zipper will go from about an inch in from this end all the way up to that end about an inch in um, so we can make it as long as possible. Uh, Brian wants a, to use three vinyls on this. This back part's going to be a tan channeling and then a navy piece and then another tan piece that's uh, not channeled, just flat vinyl. So we're going to uh, kind of randomly draw a line on here until we get it 
uh, the way that we think it looks good. Um, this is definitely personal preference. We've made a couple starting points here and here. Using this grease pencil will allow us to remove the marks if we're not happy. To remove the marks, use a rag with water. Okay. Um, we use the yellow grease pencil because if we decide that we want to change this, it will right, wipe right off and you won't be uh, distracted by your old lines. Um, I think we have this where we want it, so we're going to go over it with the marker so that it's a little bit stronger line. And I'm going to mark these with tan, blue, and uh, tan channel. Tan, blue, and channeling. Here's a look ahead. Now we can remove the patterning material. Okay, we're ready to um, get our pattern ready for the vinyl. I'm going to straighten up this back edge where I had that uh, little piece of padding that was kind of wobbly. And I don't really want to cut wobbly pieces out, so I'm going to straighten this up from this point up here to this point down here. And that's the line I'm going to use for my finished size. At this point, we will cut it out only along the outer edge. For the underside of our cushion, we're going to use cushion underlining material. We'll use the pattern to pattern the bottom plate. Here's a quick anatomy of a cushion. I'm going to cut out my cushion underlining first. Um, this pattern is going to be cut into three pieces, and I want to have a solid piece to use um, to pattern my foam off of. So before I cut this up for my top plate, I'm going to cut out my cushion underlining with a quarter inch seam all the way around the edge. Use masking tape to secure the patterning material. And the only thing that's going to get cut on this piece is to install the zipper and it's just a slit. So it will stay um, the size that I cut it right now um, until it goes into the cushion. To install the zipper for this application, we will sew the zipper in place and then just slit it down the middle of the teeth. So we're going to add a quarter of an inch to our finished size. This bottom plate will be a quarter inch larger than the actual finished size of the cushion all around the perimeter. This will allow us to have a plate that is tightly fitted on the bottom side of a cushion. The actual sew and seam allowance will be a half inch. This will make the plate slightly smaller than the cushion. So I'm going to mark this uh, with the wrong side because I don't want to get it turned over. This will be the inside of the cushion. Uh, one other thing I want to note on my um, cushion underlining pattern is how far the zipper is in. And it's about four inches so I can make a line on the cushion underlining also um, like I did here. Cushion underlining material will not unravel. It can be simply cut with scissors. Okay, to remind myself uh, while I'm working with this piece that I've already added a seam to this, I'm going to just write on each edge. Later on, we'll use this to pattern our foam. This will remind us of this fact. Because this is what we'll use to pattern our foam from. Our top plate will be made from three different colors. If yours is only one color, then cut it to the same size as the bottom plate you just made. Now I'm ready to cut this uh, piece into three pieces for the tan, the blue, and the channeling. And I'm going to make some uh, reference marks so that when I sew this together, I have some reference where the pieces should match. Because our top plate has three different fabrics that must be sewn together, they will be cut larger than the actual pattern to account for seam allowance and also shrinkage that naturally occurs during sewing. Okay, we're ready to cut our tan piece out of the vinyl, and I have the vinyl with the right side down. So I'm going to turn this piece over so that the right side of this piece is also down. The writing on the pattern material is upside down. I'm going to put a couple pieces of tape to hold it in place while I work with it. And on this curved part where I'm going to seam it together, I want to add a half an inch for a seam. Out here, I'm going to add an inch because I want to cut this down with the cushion underlining piece that we just cut to size. And I want to leave myself some extra to work with just in case it's not exact. I don't want to try and make this outside edge exact right now. So out here, I'm just adding an inch. As discussed earlier, this extra inch will allow for any shrinkage that may occur when we sew them together. And on this edge, I'll make it a half an inch. 
a half inch here because this is the edge that will be sewn to the opposite panel and we will use a half inch seam allowance. So here she adds a half inch all along this edge. Notice that as she marks along the edge of the patterned material, the clear acrylic ruler is always parallel to the edge of the patterned material and she only marks on a plane that is parallel to that edge of the patterned material. Then it can be cut along those lines that are struck down on the vinyl seating material fabric. At this point, don't remove the pattern material that's been taped onto the back of the fabric. We still need to mark the match-up marks. We'll do that at the end. Um, we're going to cut the blue piece, and I have the right side down on the table, the wrong side up. And I'm going to tape this one down and add some to the edges, um, just like I did to the other one. These two curved lines will get a half an inch seam, and this edge right here will get the extra inch and down here we'll get the extra inch. The Durascrim pattern material is laying on the table so the words are upside down again. We're writing on the bottom side of the fabric. Since the procedure is exactly the same, we're gonna move ahead and show cutting this out. For the third color on our cushion, we've chosen to use a channeling fabric. That's next. So we have the right side uh, down on the table and I've turned my pattern over and I'm going to draw my um, inch allowance out here and a half an inch allowance here where this curve is. An inch anywhere it's not seamed together for any possible shrinkage and a half inch where edges will be sewn together. Okay, all three of our panels are cut out. Now it's time to join them up. I have all three pieces cut now with the uh, right sides down on the table and my pattern's still attached to the piece. So I'm gonna go back and um, mark my reference points on my pieces before I take the patterns off. So I can take my patterns off and start sewing my pieces together. We will sew the tan and blue sections together using a French seam, or what is sometimes called a double top stitch. On the underside of a French seam, a reinforcing strip of fabric. For us, grain polyester binding is used. This helps to provide the strength of that seam. If your top plate is a solid section of fabric, skip the next two chapters. Okay, we have our three pieces cut and marked, and I'm going to sew these two pieces together first, right sides together. And I'm going to start down at this end, and um, you can see that our marks are very close. Um, so I'm going to use those as my guideline as I go down and make sure that they stay close on all the edges. Okay. I want this to be an fairly accurate half inch seam. So I'm going to use this seam guide, magnetic seam guide, and attach it to my sh uh, the base of my machine using the half inch on the seam gauge. And then I'm ready to stitch. This will be the first of three stitches. This first stitch is a half inch from the raw edges of the fabric. She'll be careful that the edges are lined up perfectly as she sews along the length of the fabric assembly. And she'll also ensure that the matchup marks are coming out directly on top of each other as she sews this top plate together. If this assembly didn't have shape, the matchup marks would not be important. But as you can see here, there is a rounded shape to these two panels that are being sewn together. So for us, keeping the matchup marks directly on top of each other is important. This edge is okay. It should end up like this with a little bit of extra on the tan. Um, See, technically it matches the pattern when you turn it under like that. The first stitch is done. Now we'll talk about the reinforcement for the bottom side. We want to do a um, top stitch finish on either side of this, um, which is sometimes called a French seam. So in order to do that, we need to flatten out these two seams. And I'm going to use this grosgrain ribbon 
and then attach the seam stick to it and then attach that to the seam to hold it in place while I'm stitching. This is a one inch grow grain ribbon that's available from Sayerite. It will help strengthen this French seam. Without it, the center stitch is very weak. Basting it in place will help us to avoid from having to line it up as we sew. So this will hold the seam in place while I'm stitching, but it also makes the seam stronger. It is important to press down the half inch flanges from the first stitch flat as it's being basted. Uh, we'll be sewing closer to the center, so it doesn't have to be, this doesn't have to be exactly centered on the back side. Since the top stitch is approximately a quarter inch from the first stitch, the grow grain ribbon does not need to be perfectly centered. Now for this stitching, I'm going to stitch with the edge of the foot along my seam on either side. And notice the right side of the presser foot is directly on top of that seam or first stitch. For a more professional look, go slow and be sure to guide the fabric so the foot is directly on top of that first stitch. I'm going to turn it around and do the same thing on the tan side with the edge of the presser foot at the seam line. By flipping the panel and starting from the opposite end, we're still sewing with that first stitch right up against the right side of the presser foot. This last top stitch completes the French seam. A few things to consider. We're using a V92 thread. Sometimes even heavier threads look best with a French seam or contrasting colored threads. Next, we will sew the vinyl channeling fabric to this assembly. We find that a top stitch does not look as good in channeling fabric, so we will only place a top stitch in the blue vinyl fabric. Okay, we're ready to sew the channeling piece to the other two pieces. Um, and it goes on this blue edge right here. You can see the curve matches. Uh, one thing that we want to be really careful of when we're sewing on the channeling is it because of the, the foam in here, you, have, you might have a tendency to really stretch it, and we don't want to do that. We want to keep it the cut size just like it is now. So we're going to use the seam stick on this and um, make sure that our marks are lined up while we're putting the seam stick on. And I'm also going to stitch with the channeling on the bottom. The underneath teeth have a tendency to pull the bottom fabric quicker than the top fabric, so that'll help keep this from stretching also. Just a few moments ago, Cindy called the batting inside the channeling foam. It's actually polyester batting. Well, when I put this on, I'm putting it as close to the edge as possible. I have a half inch seam allowed here, so um, I want to keep this within that half an inch seam. Our sewing seam allowance here will be a half inch, so this quarter inch width of seam stick or basting tape will be well away from the stitch that will be placed in this fabric assembly. That is very important. You would not want this glue to come in contact with the stitch because when the assembly is turned right side out, that glue would be on the top side, which would not be good. It would collect dirt and be ugly. So. Keep that quarter inch basting tape well along the outer edge of the fabric so it's not sewing through accidentally. This quarter inch basting tape will keep the panels in the appropriate position, but more importantly, for the channeling fabric, it will keep us from accidentally stretching or shrinking the channeling fabric as it is sewn. Remember earlier, Cindy talked about the channeling fabric having a batting inside of it. And unfortunately, that batting allows the fabric to be easily stretched. We want it to be consistently basted along this edge so that there is no stretch. Nice thing about the basting tape, if you're not happy, you can peel it up again and reapply it. As she's basing this, you'll notice three things. One, she's matching up the matchup marks as she bases. Two, she is not stretching the channeling fabric. She's trying to ensure that it goes down even all along the length. And three, she's matching up the raw edges of both the blue fabric and the channeling fabric, including this curved area. This was a slightly time-consuming procedure, but as you can see, it came out perfectly. Both this end and the opposite end are exactly where it should fall. Um, when we lay this down after I've got it pressed with the seam stick, you can see that the channels 
look uh, pretty consistent all the way down. Uh, my marks here and my marks here are matching. And down here at the end, we have that little uh, angle like we had over here. And on this end, my edges are even, and I had added an inch to bolt all three of these pieces, and they still all match up. So we're going to stitch it. We'll set up our magnetic guide so that the seam allowance is again a half inch. Because these two panels are basted together, we can do this rather quickly. However, we still recommend going nice and slow so that your half inch seam allowance is consistent. To sew this cushion together, we're using the world's best portable walking foot sewing machine, the Serite LS1. It is a straight stitch, heavy duty sewing machine. Serite also carries the world famous LSZ-1, which is a straight stitch and zigzag stitched walking foot sewing machine. Get yours today at www.serite.com. Stitching, and I'm only going to stitch on the blue side of this. Uh, we did a test panel, and we didn't like it stitched over here. So I'm going to stitch on the blue side with the edge of the presser foot as my guide again. And as you're doing this, you want to make sure that your seam is spread open um, so you don't have any folds in the blue. Cindy is pulling those two panels apart so that the first stitch is splayed nice and flat and keeping that presser foot, the right side of the presser foot, right along that first stitch. She's also sewing through the half inch tail on the underside. We'll be showing you that at the end to show you exactly what we're doing. But we want to be sure that we sew through the half inch tail that uh, the first stitch created. This row of stitching right here has uh, covered or secured both layers of the blue vinyl and the channeling. Uh, so that makes a really nice strong seam. And the seam stick, you can't see it right here, but the seam stick is inside here. So you'll never see it and it won't get stuck on anything else. We have our pieces all sewn together and uh, we have a little bit of rippling in this, uh, in the vinyl. We want this to lay as flat as possible before we cut it to the size of our um, pattern. So I'm going to use the strapping tape on the table and then put the seam stick on top of it so that we can hold this uh, firm on the table before we cut the pattern and try and flatten out a little bit of this. Strapping tape will be placed on the tabletop along all four sides of the plate and then double-sided tape will be placed on top of the strapping tape so that it can easily be removed from the table after we're done. The top plate will be placed on top of this and smoothed out so it's nice and flat. That's what this uh, basting tape will be used for. The culprit of the wrinkling is due to the fact that the panels had to be sewn together and there's a lot of curve in those panels. And so we do expect a little bit of wrinkling. We're going to try to work out the wrinkles and not stretch the fabric too much, but try to smooth out the wrinkles and baste it to the tabletop so that when we place our bottom plate, which is cut exactly to the size that we want this top plate, we can achieve that same size. We have the seam stick down on the table and our, our um, piece that we made on top of it. And you can see that right here, I want to try and eliminate that if I can. So if I lift it up off the seam stick and just stretch it just a little bit, it works that uh, extra vinyl out. With the top plate flat, we can use the bottom plate that already has the quarter inch built in all around the perimeter. We'll use that as the pattern. So the next step will be to lay the pattern on and uh, trace around it for my the size of my top plate. and. You can see that down here we had added an inch. So there's the inch that we added and it, the vinyl has taken up just a little bit in stitching and that's normal. That's why we added the extra inch around so we'd have plenty to work with. Same thing down here, I'm about a quarter of an inch short. So it's important to add that extra inch because you're going to lose some just stitching it together. So I have my piece all secured to the table with the seam stick and this is the size that I want the top plate to be also. So I'm going to go around this piece and mark it with a pencil. 
so I can cut my top plate from this pattern that we created. After we're done marking around it, we can remove it from the tabletop and remove any double-sided tape that may be stuck to the panel. Then we'll cut around. Because we're cutting vinyl fabric, we do not need to use a hot knife. The edges will not unravel. Since this Powerboat Lounge cushion has a top end that takes a slanted upward turn then transitions horizontally at the extreme top, we need to do some special patterning for the boxing. Back at the boat, we're using cardboard and tracing a line. Here, Cindy will explain it. This is our pattern for our boxing on our cushion. And this is the part that we're going to use from here up. And we'll add a seam out here. And when we decide the, the width of the boxing, we'll add a seam up here. So the boxing will take the same shape as the, the boat. As a general guideline to determine the width of the boxing to cut, measure your foam thickness. For us, we are using a three inch foam. To this measurement, add between a quarter inch and three quarter inch. This is the pattern that we drew off the frame um, of the boat for the shape. And I'm gonna, we're gonna cut our boxing at three and a half inches. So I'm gonna um, mark that here so we can trim this piece down to the correct size. Keep in mind that thinner cushions look best with more allowance added and thicker cushions look best with less. Basically, adding less of an allowance will allow the seams to roll into the edges of the cushion. We are cutting our boxing to three and a half inches in width. Okay, so we have our piece of cardboard and um, we brought it back to the boat to check it and make sure that our angles are correct. And I want to mark the corners while I have it here at the boat. Cindy cut the cardboard out. It's three and a half inches in width from that bottom line. Cindy is marking exactly where the edges of the cushion should fall. So there at the top and here at the bottom edge. So this is the front box, the right side. And I'm gonna trim off the top so that I can move it back here and measure for my back boxing. Well, it still fits really well up here into the corner. For the boxing up against the port side of the boat, she places that strip there and she'll place a mark here at the bottom edge since it's curved. So that's where my back boxing should come to. And I'm gonna mark this side, back boxing, right side. Um, this is the right side right side of the fabric, wrong side of the fabric on the back boxing, and right side of the fabric, wrong side of the fabric on the front boxing. Back at the sewing table, she marks the opposite edges where the finished cushion should stop for the front and rear boxing. Okay, we're getting ready to cut the boxing strips for our cushion, and because of the angle down here, I'm gonna put a few lines on this piece um, to get a proper measurement for the boxing in the front and the back. This is the wrong side or the inside of the cushion underlining fabric. So I'm making a line a half an inch in on three sides. This line indicates where the half inch seam will be placed on this, the bottom plate. Now she can measure with a fabric tape measure. So to get the length of my boxing for uh, this front, this angle, and this side, I can start up here at the very edge, which will allow my half an inch seam. And down here, I want to measure a half an inch beyond where those two lines cross. So my boxing for this side will be 63 inches. She will write these all down on the cardboard strip she cut out. You'll see that a little bit later on. It'll be 18 inches down here, which is a half an inch longer from where my lines cross and a half an inch longer on this side. And you can see that it doesn't actually come all the way out to the edge of my pattern. These measurements are what the length of the boxing should be. And that includes for the half inch seam allowance. 
And this one measures 55 and a quarter to where my lines cross, so this one will be cut at 55 and three quarters. And this one is 16 and a half. As discussed earlier, all those measurements should be written down someplace. She did it on the cardboard. Okay, we're going to cut out our uh, front and back boxing, and I'm going to draw on the vinyl again, so I'm going to turn it over with the right side facing the table. We've already added our seam allowance to this piece, so I'm going to just trace around it. Our foam was three inches wide. We added a half inch to that, so this boxing width is three and a half inches overall. She's tracing around it now. And I'm going to leave it a little bit long in case we need to make any adjustments down here. We can measure the exact length after we cut it out. And I need two of these, one for the front and one for the back. Notice that the cardboard strip has been flipped, but she positioned it differently so she could save on fabric. Then it is simply cut out with shears. So from our measurements over here, we need we still need a 16 and a half inch piece and an 18 inch piece, three and a half inches wide. Um, this is the front boxing. We want to make sure that we get this angle in the right place. So I'm going to label these with front and back. So our front measurement was 55 and 3 quarters. And the back one needs to be 63. So I'm going to measure um, across the edge of this at about a half an inch in where the seam would be. And I'm going to kind of walk the tape measure standing up because I think I get a more accurate measurement that way. So that's where I would need to cut this piece off. And I'm going to do the same thing with the front piece. Start it at the very edge of your cut and just walk it along at about a half an inch in. And this one is 55 and 3 quarters. So that's where I will cut this one off. Okay, so I'm going to use my uh, the mark that I made and square it with the, this seam right here. And that's where I'll cut this off. That clear acrylic ruler is awesome. Great. We have all the boxing strips cut to the appropriate width and length. We're now ready to apply our piping to the top plate, which is what we desire. If you do not desire piping, you can skip this chapter. The Sayerite has a lot of prefabricated vinyl pipings in stock for your next cushion project. Okay, I'm going to apply the piping to the edges of the top plate. And the foot is going to guide the piping for me. I'm going to keep the piping edge along the edge of the cushion, the cut edge of the cushion. And I'm not going to stretch the channeling out as I go. I'm going to try to keep it nice and smooth and not put any uh, tension on the channeling piece. This is the back edge of the cushion near the center. Notice she's left about four to five inches unsewn at the end so it can be joined up later on. We do not want to stretch or pull the channeling fabric or shrink it up as we sew, so she's being careful. Because of that batting, the channeling fabric has a tendency to pull or shrink depending on how it's handled. So handle it carefully so that it does not change its shape. At the corner, you'll notice she buries her needle a half inch away from the opposite edge, lifts the presser foot, 
rolls the assembly around, lowers the presser foot, and then continues to sew. The Sayerite Alterfeed sewing machines have a welting or cording tunnel that is built right into the standard foot. If you're sewing with a different sewing machine, you may need to install a cording foot to sew this piping in place. The tunnel allows for the piping to be fed so that the stitch is placed right next to the cording channel. Here she's coming to another corner. She'll roll the balance wheel over by hand so the needle is buried in the fabric about a half inch from the other edge. Lift the presser foot, roll the assembly, lower the presser foot, and then continue to sew. This prefabricated piping has slits in the tail edge. Those slits allow it to take turns rather nicely. We're going to skip ahead to a corner that is rather sharp, more than 90 degrees. Watch what Cindy does here. When I get to this corner, this is a very sharp angle, so I am going to make a few cuts in the piping to go around this corner. These extra slits will allow the piping to take this sharp turn even better. Same process, bury the needle a half inch from the edge. Lift the presser foot, roll the assembly, position the piping, lower the presser foot, and continue to sew. Notice how those slits made that corner come out even better. We'll now skip ahead to where the piping has to be joined together. get back to where I started I'm going to cut this off a couple of inches beyond uh, the other edge and open this up. To aid in splaying open the piping she will use her scissors and force it in there to break the glue seal at the end then she can peel it back exposing the foam cording inside of the vinyl cover. I want to cut the cording itself off to match the other piece of cording. And I'm going to cut this piece at a diagonal with my scissors kind of angled to keep as much color on the vinyl as possible. And tuck that inside. And wrap it around and finish stitching. Now our piping has been installed to the top plate. We'll now proceed to making the zipper on the bottom plate and also straps for the snaps that will secure it to the boat. I'm going to tape uh, my pattern back together so that we can mark uh, where the snaps go and where we want to put the zipper on this. Um, this is something that you can do before you take it all apart. Um, we didn't think of that. Okay, we're ready to mark our where our snaps go on this piece and this is the um, the top of the bottom plate or the inside of the bottom plate. So I'm going to flip it over and mark my snaps on the outside. And remember we've added a quarter of an inch all the way around this. Remember back on the boat we placed marks where each snap is located. We're going to use this pattern to indicate where they go on the bottom plate. And then the zipper we want to mark on the, on the wrong side. So I'm going to flip it back over to the wrong side. And we know that that's about four inches in from the back edge. To install the zipper, I'm going to just lay the zipper teeth on that pencil line a little bit beyond my mark 
there and run the edge of the foot right along the edge of the zipper teeth. When sewing a zipper down, we do not want that stitch to be any closer than about an eighth inch away from the teeth. Otherwise, the slider puller will be difficult to pull up and down to open or close the zipper. Once she has one side secured, she will sew the other side by flipping the panel and starting from the opposite end. Here she cuts the zipper to the appropriate length. Now watch her flip the panel and she'll start from the opposite and end. Turn it around and go down the other side the same way. She does this so that she's sewing that zipper on with the same side of the presser foot, the right side. Thus, the stitch is equal from side to side as presser feet may be different in width from the right side to the left side. It is always important to install the slider before you put stops on the zipper. Here she pushes the slider in position so that the slider puller is facing the fabric. Now she can install stops. I'm going to add these little pieces at each end of the zipper. Uh, this will be my zipper stop. This is a scrap piece of the cushion underlining fabric that's been folded in half. And then she sews several times over the teeth, being careful not to have the needle hit one of the zipper teeth and deflect. This is the Sayerite Ultrafeed LS1 sewing machine. It's a very heavy duty sewing machine. If you're using a home sewing machine, you may want to walk the stitching over the zipper teeth. You don't have to worry about it with this machine. Okay, now I can slide my zipper down and out of the way so that I can cut on this line. So I'm going to fold it in half like that to get it started. And then turn it over and cut down the center of my stitching. Installing a zipper this way is a quick and easy way to install a zipper for a cushion. Because we're using cushion underlining fabric on the bottom side, we do not have to worry about the slit unraveling or the fabric unraveling. So if you want a quick way to install a zipper, follow this technique. Okay, we're going to getting ready to apply the straps for the snaps on the bottom of this cushion. And I want to cut these about four inches long. And I'm going to need one for each of the dots that I have here on my pattern. Um, we're cutting it four inches so that your hand fits inside it so that you can get underneath there and apply the snap. And I'm going to use the hot knife to seal the edge of it. By using the Sayerite Edge Hot Knife, we don't have to worry about the edges of the webbing unraveling. We like to use one and a half inch width webbing so that we can place the snap more easily and ensure that we're going to have the snap in the webbing. Um, when we apply these little um, straps here, we're going to lay them over the dot and put them in the direction that it's going to be easiest for us to get our hand in and snap it down. This is actually the back of the cushion when it uh, goes together, so they'll all go this way front and back until we get down here to this corner. And this one, it won't lay over the zipper. I'll make this one a little bit smaller, but it'll go along this angle so that we can get our hand in from this angle to snap this one on. And I'm gonna use the double-sided tape just to hold this in place while I stitch it a little bit on each end. When I put this one on, we're going to connect it into the seam so that we still have enough room to get our fingers in there and snap it down. Now the rest of them will just be centered over the uh, where I've made the mark. So I'm going to take it over to the machine and stitch here and here. Be sure to do reversing several times to secure this webbing in place, otherwise it may not hold. We probably should have done even more there than what Cindy did. I would do it about four times back and forth over top of that position. Okay, we have all the straps applied to the bottom plate of our cushion, and this is actually the right side of it. Um, these are uh, big enough that we can stick our hand in there. There'll be a snap right here to snap onto the boat with all of these. Now that our bottom plate is ready, we can move on to joining the boxing and sewing it to the plate.
Now we're going to sew the boxing strips together and then apply them to the top plate. The boxing should be positioned around the cushion as shown. This way it cuts down on confusion. Then grab the corresponding boxing and lay it over the top of the other so the outside surfaces are facing each other. Then take it to the sewing machine. We will sew a half inch seam allowance, making sure the ends are butted up to each other. Do some reversing at the beginning and the end of the stitching. Once these three sections of boxing are sewn together, we'll take it back and lay it around our top and bottom plates to determine where the next boxing strip should be joined. This is a rather important step. It helps you to keep everything orientated appropriately. Remember, our boxing has a slightly odd shape because of the lounge chair effect of this cushion and we want it to go the right direction. So we do this to confirm that everything will be sewn together exactly as it should. Now we know how those pieces should be sewn. We take them to the sewing machine and create that half inch seam at the end of each one of these boxing strips. That will join all four strips together as one to make a round circle. Let's move ahead and show you what it looks like when they're all sewn together. This is a good spot to make sure you haven't twisted any of these and they're all going the right direction. We're going to uh, use this quarter inch seam stick on this seam and um, it's not absolutely necessary to do this, but because of the angles on this cushion, I think it'll be easier to hold everything in place while I'm working with it. Um, we don't really want to put pins in vinyl, so this is a, a good way to secure everything so it stays in place while you're stitching all the way around the perimeter of this cushion. And I'm putting it out at the edge um, because I don't want it to be anywhere where it could possibly show when the cushion is finished. So I'm keeping it away from the seam. Because our cushion has a lot of shape or slanted sections, we recommend using this basting tape to pre-secure the boxing to the plates. Why? This will ensure that all our corners come out perfectly. And if they do not, we can rebaste it prior to sewing it together, saving time and also ensuring that when we sew, it will be perfect. Where a seam was placed on the boxing should be the exact corner, so she's being careful to line up that seam right at the exact corner of the plate. It is sometimes helpful to take scissors and cut into the corner so that it goes around the corner nicer. Do not go past the half inch seam allowance that will be taken up when we take it to the sewing machine and sew. We don't want that slit to go beyond that. Here you can see the boxing that takes a gradual slanted curve. We'll match that up and baste it together there. We will show most of the process of basting this boxing to the plate because there is a lot of shape in here. Here she has to make another slit and that slit is a little bit deeper than a half inch. That's a slight mistake. Probably come out all right, but we'd rather not go that deep. She'll continue to baste all around the perimeter making sure the corners match up perfectly. If they do not, she'll peel it apart and rebaste. This corner is not a 90 degree turn, so she's going to skip that and go to where a corner is sharper or deeper than 90 degrees. The gradual corners are harder to match up. This one is not. Cuts a few slits on both sides of that seam that joins the boxing together and then makes sure that that uh, stitch is right at that corner. Now she can go the opposite direction and baste it to that gradual corner here. When she goes around this corner, you'll notice there's too much fabric. Watch what Cindy does to deal with that issue. And you can see that we have a little bit of extra vinyl right here. So what I'm going to do about that is uh, lift it up off of the seam stick. And I'm going to adjust this seam right here a little bit. This isn't exactly a square corner. I rounded this corner off. So this seam can uh, come around the edge just a little bit. 
So I'm going to take it back to the machine, leave everything stuck that is stuck right now, and just uh, take this seam in just a little bit to compensate for the extra that's shown up right there. This is one of the major advantages to pre-basting boxing to plates, especially when there's a lot of shape like this. We can take out the excess just by moving that stitch that joins those two boxing pieces together about a quarter inch inside the first stitch. This will resolve that excess fabric that you saw earlier. Watch. So I'm going to trim this extra off so it's not quite so bulky in there and then attach it to the seam stick. Notice now the excess fabric is gone and everything lays perfect just as we want. Now we still have more basting to do so let's go to work on the other side which is the back side of this cushion. This angle is a little hard to see, so we're going to reposition it. We're still working on the back side. We'll create a slit there, but not so deep. That's much better than the other side where we went too deep in the slit. Look at that, almost perfect. That side we had to do nothing. It was exactly what it should be. Now we'll position it under the sewing machine's foot and the cording tunnel is built into the Sayerite Ultrafeed LS1 sewing machine. So since it's all basted in place, we just need to sew around the entire perimeter. And we can do this rather quickly, just keeping that cording in the tunnel. You can't see the cording, but the sewing machine does a pretty good job of keeping everything in place. You still have to guide it. It's not foolproof. As long as you guide it carefully, your cushion should come out beautifully. Here we're going to come to that curve in the boxing and watch what she does there. She will have to twist the assembly slightly at that curve. Notice that she pivots it slightly and then continues to sew to the corner. When she gets to the corner, she will bury her needle and turn the corner. She is rebasting a little bit there. It looks like she could, could position it a little bit better. That's not uncommon, uh, especially uh, when you do any kind of basting when you reach a corner. If you feel like your corner could be better, rebaste before you sew. Needles buried, foot's up, foot's get lowered, and then she continues to sew. Again, we're using the Sayrite Ultrafeed LS1 sewing machine, the world's best portable walking foot sewing machine. When we're done sewing, it's not a bad idea to turn your assembly right side out and inspect the corners. If your stitch is too far from a corner, you can always put it back into the sewing machine and re-sew it again. As long as your sewing doesn't go into the piping, you're good. Nobody will good. see the re-stitching that may be required for your cushion.
Okay, the boxing all sewn to the um, top plate, and I'm going to use the seam stick again on the bottom plate, and I'm going to apply it to the right side, close to the edge. The process, exactly like we did before, basting tape will be used to pre-baste this bottom plate to the boxing. Outside surfaces are facing each other. Match up corners, baste it around. Not much explanation is needed here. The process is exactly the same except for the fact that you are having to work with the boxing off the edge of the table. We'll show this basting process in double time now. Nice. On this seam, I don't have the cording to run through the tunnel and keep my half inch seam even all the way around. So I'm going to put the seam gui guide back on at a half an inch. And I'm going to stitch with a vinyl on top so that I can see what's going on when I get to these corners. We can sew around this rather quickly because everything's basted in place. We'll sew around the entire perimeter doing the same procedure we did when we reach a corner. Bury the needle, lift the foot, turn the assembly, lower the foot, and then continue to sew around. Let's move on. Here we're rounding the last corner and coming to where we began our stitching. We'll just sew a few inches over that and we are done. Now we can open up the zipper and turn the assembly right side out. The cushion cover is complete. We still need to install snaps, but before we do that, we need to cut and glue the sections of foam together to accommodate the shape of this powerboat lounge cushion. We'll go back to the boat and cut our foam to the approximate size of our opening, slightly oversized. Uh, we're going to use this dry fast foam for this uh, cushion. Um, and you can see right here that we've seamed a couple pieces together. Um, you can glue these together easily and it um, doesn't cause any problems as they're used. So we've got the cushion laid on the, the main part of the bench. This part back here I've squared up. Um, so it fits snug against the side of the boat. I'm just going to take a marker and draw a line on the bottom side of the foam that follows the boat. The side plate has been removed, so when we trace this foam, it'll be a little bit oversized, and we want that. We want it to be oversized so that we can make final calculations with our actual pattern when we're done gluing it all together. Up here on in this area, I'm going to cut an angle on this piece at this end and this end, and I'm going to cut this piece square or straight and this piece square or straight, and this one is going to have the angles in it to make this angle here. This is actually old dry fast foam that we found here at Sayerite. It's a three inch thickness. We can cut it easily with the kitchen knife. Remember, it's slightly oversized. We'll be cutting it yet again with the pattern later on. Okay, now I can use this scrap piece for this small piece up here. It is common and customary to glue sections of foam together. Typically, most manufacturers of cushions do not throw much foam away. They will take sections and glue it together when necessary. You can hardly tell that there's a seam when the cushion cover is placed over the foam. So do this and expect it when you make your own cushions. Remember, we removed the padded side plate, so this foam is actually oversized, even though it doesn't look like it. Okay, we're going to use this scrap piece of foam for this area right here. Um, so first I'm going to cut it to the correct width and just draw a line underneath again with my um, marker. 
And now I'm ready to draw these angles here and here. So make sure that this piece is where it needs to be out here on the end and that this piece is where it needs to be. With those pieces lined up with that angle, she'll hold that middle piece of foam up to the edges, then use her Sharpie marker and mark the angles that she needs to create in this section of foam. Here you can see it through the dirty glass. Okay, good. I'm going to cut one angle on this and test it and make sure it's okay. So I know that this comes right out at the very edge. So I'm going to lay my square in here at where this mark comes to and square it up and draw my line here. And then from that line, I can draw a line out to this corner. Now when I cut this, I'm going to cut it with this uh, black line towards me so I can see where I'm at and do my best to keep the blade at the back angle here. This is a good way to cut a wedge. The wedge that she cuts is not perfect, but it's good enough. Foam does not need to be cut exactly perfectly square. You'll notice that when the cover is done, even if the foam is slightly uneven on the edges, it still will look great. A little bit thick right there. I'm going to test the fit on this before I cut the top angle. So I'm just going to set it in here and it, make sure that everything is where I want it to be down here. And it looks like a really good fit right here at this corner. And it looks like once we put the glue on, that's going to work really well. Um, it does not have to be exact. Once you put the glue on, it's going to pull anything together um, that's not cut perfectly straight. And then once you put the cushion cover on, it's all going to hold it in place. Now this second foam is not right on the edge. So she'll place a mark on this side and there's a mark on the other side and she'll try to follow that as she cuts it now with the electric kitchen knife. Um, you can see right here I've got a little bit of a hole um, from cutting the foam not quite at the right angle. If you wanted to is this is the angle that I cut off down here and it actually fits really well to fill in that uh, little area. So you could also do that if you felt like you wanted to fill that in and that would also work. No one's ever going to know that you glued this foam together um, and it's going to work just as well as if it was all one piece. Sailrite recommends using 3M General Trim Adhesive to glue dry fast and polyurethane foam okay. together. We're ready to glue our pieces together and uh, we decided to use this little piece to fill in that hole so I'm just going to put glue on both sides and add this piece first. As you can see, she's already glued some of it. We didn't get to show that on film, so she's just applying a little bit more. We have this paper on the um, boat so that we don't get glue all over the boat seat. Be sure to follow the instructions on the spray adhesive. We recommend the uh, solvent evaporate before gluing sections together. Typically that's one to four minutes. You should be able to feel for when the glue becomes tacky with your finger, and that's the time to glue it together. However, dry fast foam is such a porous material that the solvents will still be allowed to evaporate even if you do not wait. We still recommend waiting one to four minutes. Spray both surfaces for good adhesion. Even when foam is glued together, not so well, it'll still hold together well when the cover is applied, so don't worry if it's not bonded perfectly. We recommend that you allow your foam to dry for several hours before patterning again or stuffing into the cushion cover if that's the next step. We have all the pieces glued and I'm just going to keep working with it to make sure it stays together and it makes a nice smooth seam. We're ready to cut our um, foam to size and I've got the pattern laid on here and 
this top corner matched up. We know that this point is the exact size and we know that this point is the exact size. So I'm uh, trying to keep it in line the best I can with my cardboard and I'm going to go around and just make a mark around the perimeter of this pattern and then I'll do my measurements to get the foam a little bit bigger. This is the original pattern and it is what we want the desired finished cushion to be when completed. However, we want the foam to be 1% larger on both dimensions. So, after she marks this along the edge of the pattern material, she will add a little to each side to accommodate the 1% general guideline that Sarah recommends for cutting foam. Um, you can see why I needed to hold this up with, to go along with my pattern because when I lay it down, it actually changes shape. Okay, I'm gonna uh, remove my pattern now and add uh, the 1% to all the sides. Let's discuss the 1% extra factor that we used as a general guideline for cutting the foam to size. We want the cushion cover to fit snugly over the foam. That's how we made it. So because of that fact, the cushion cover will compress the foam slightly. But we do not want the foam to shrink too much and thus not fit properly in the area it will be used in. So we will add 1% to both dimensions of the foam to help the cushion to be firmly fitted and to keep it from being too small for the area it was designed to fit in. This illustration is our example. Here you can see Cindy using the clear acrylic ruler to add the 5 8 and the half inch. Now you can use the electric kitchen knife to cut the foam out, or here we're using the AccuCutter 350, available from Sailrite. Once the foam is cut to size, it's now time to insert the foam inside the cushion cover. Unzip the zipper and start pushing the foam into the cover. You'll need to work the corners of the cushion by inserting your hand and pushing the foam into the corners. We will not show this like I'm being entire tortured process. Yet. Good. That's what happens when you work a sail right. <laughs> it is always a good idea to take the cushion to the boat to determine where the snap should be installed on the underside of our cushion. Okay. Uh, we're ready to see how this fits. Uh, and it looks like it's going to work really well. Um, this panel will be replaced uh, eventually. So we need to mark where our snaps are going to go and we can lift this up and get our finger in there and uh, get a pencil in there and put a dot right where the snap needs to go in. We will only mark a few of the straps here where the actual stud of the snap is located on the webbing strap. Then we'll take it back to our sewing table and use the pattern. So we are able to use those for reference now and we'll use the pattern that we made uh, to mark all the rest if of them If you've not the yet removed the strapping tape and double-sided tape that you use for patterning, do that. Okay, we took the cushion to the boat and marked a few of these snaps on the uh, boat. So I want to mark these on the right side so we can see them. And then I'm going to lay the pattern back on it and mark the rest of them. We marked three positions on the boat. Now we'll take our pattern and lay it over the top so that those three that we marked on the boat are directly over the dot on the pattern material. Then we'll mark the rest. To install the button and the socket, we'll use two systems. First, the snap right system, then the press and snap. To use the snap right system, push a mandrel through the center of the socket die. Then push a snap socket on top of that die until it snaps into position. Insert a snap right button into this button die. The button die has been screwed onto a standard riveting tool. Then push the mandrel through the location on the webbing. 
push the snap button's barrel over the mandrel, then to press the lever of the riveting tool a few times until the snap is securely set into position. The mandrel does not necessarily need to break. Once it feels firmly installed, then you can remove the tool and the bottom die. Your snap is installed. Now let's use the press and snap system and show you how to use that tool. Insert a button snap into the die. Then install the socket onto the opposite die. It snaps into position. Locate it over the position that you desire the snap to be installed in the webbing. The press and snap tool punches a hole through the webbing at the same time as it installs the snap. One squeeze of the lever and your snap is installed. You could purchase the SnapRite system or the press and snap tool from Sayerite today. Using the system you purchased, install the remainder of the snaps. Our cushion is now complete. Coming up next is the materials lists and the tools that we use to build this cushion. Cushions like this can be made from a variety of outdoor fabrics, including Morbin Seabrook Marine Quality Vinyl and other brands like Naugahyde Vinyl. If you prefer the same methods can be used with woven fabrics like Sombrella Marine Grade or Giabella Fabric from Sayerite. Other great tutorial videos that are related to this one are coming soon. Click on a video to see when it is available. For more free videos like this, be sure to check out the Sayerite website or subscribe to the Sayerite YouTube channel. It's your loyal patronage to Sayerite that makes these free videos available. Thanks for your loyal support. I'm Eric Grant and from all of us here at Sayerite, thanks for watching.